Good evening. My name is Billy Burke, and I'm the Chief of Organizational Effectiveness for Baltimore County Public Schools. Welcome to Community Conversations. Tonight we'll be discussing the reopening for the 2020-2021 school year. As moderator, I will be monitoring the, the um, question feature because tonight you're going to hear a presentation from our three community superintendents. And then at the end, when there's time, we'll answer some of the questions that are listed in the question and answer feature within the system. So uh, look for that button if you have a question that you'd like to put in there. At this time, I'm going to ask the community superintendents to introduce themselves. So first, we'd like to start with Ms. Christina Byers. Good evening, everyone. It is wonderful to be with all of you tonight. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. My name is Christina Byers, and I am the community superintendent for the Central Zone. I've been fortunate to have served in Baltimore County Public Schools in a variety of roles. I began my career here as a fifth grade teacher and was an administrator at both the elementary and middle school levels. I am also proud to say that my two daughters are students in BCPS. Again, we know that these are trying, difficult, and busy times, and we're grateful that you can be with us tonight. At this time, I would like to introduce my colleague, Dr. George Roberts. Good evening, Baltimore County and Team BCPS. On behalf of the zone that I represent as Community Superintendent for the East Zone, I'd like to welcome and thank all of you for joining us this evening. Um, this is, I'm entering my 16th year with Team BCPS and very proud to say that and, and very lucky to be part of this wonderful team, wonderful community and um, excellent school system. Um, I have been um, throughout the county, um, had various positions serving as assistant principal at Delaney High School, Woodlawn High School, and then having the fortunate privilege of serving as principal at Golden Ring Middle School and Perry Hall High School um, before moving on to various central office roles and ultimately as community superintendent for East Zone Schools here in Baltimore. Baltimore County. Uh, my two older daughters attended Baltimore County Public Schools and my youngest daughter is entering ninth grade in a Baltimore County Public uh, School, high school. So certainly as a parent, as an educator, as an advocate for children, um, these conversations are important and we thank you again uh, for joining us this evening. So I'd like to uh, have the privilege of introducing our third colleague uh, of our community superintendent for West Zone Schools, Dr. Raquel Jones. Thank you, Dr. Roberts, and welcome to all of our community and um, stakeholders of Baltimore County Public Schools. I am very excited to be here to represent the West Zone. My name is Raquel Jones, and I serve as the proud community superintendent of the, of the West Zone. Um, I am the proud parent of two children. I have a student who has matriculated through high school and is now in college. And I also have a daughter who's a sophomore and getting ready for reopening 2020-21. So again, we're very excited to be here and we're looking forward to providing this information to each of you. First and foremost, we, we also want to make sure that you all know that we're thinking about you and your family. We hope that your family is weathering this crisis as best as you can. Again, all three of us are parents and we know that you have concerns about your children your jobs, and your health, and that it can all be overwhelming. Unfortunately, COVID-19 is still very much with us. Cases in Baltimore County continue to be present, and it's more important than ever that we as a community follow health and safety advice by maintaining six feet of social distance, wearing a face covering to protect ourselves and others, washing our hands as often as we can, and staying home if possible if we feel sick. At this time, I'll turn it back over to Ms. Christina Byers. Ms. Byers. Thank you, Dr. Jones. If we could advance. I'm going to uh, begin this evening by just talking a little bit about the spread of this virus. So due to the spread of the virus, our school year is going to begin virtually on September 8th. However, um, I would like to take a, a, a moment right now to acknowledge and recognize uh, what occurred this afternoon. So this evening, we are going to open by acknowledging the press conference that was held this afternoon by the governor and the state superintendent of schools. We too were watching 
and we learned in real time of the doom metrics regarding the opening of schools for face-to-face -face instruction. You should be aware that local superintendents and local boards did not receive any advance notice about the details of today's announcement. Because we, like local superintendents, just learned of this information, our conversation this evening will not address transitioning to face-to-face -face learning, nor will we be able to address specific information discussed during that press conference. Rather, tonight, we're gonna focus on providing answers to the questions we received through our survey regarding the virtual opening of schools on September 8th. And so we will, as a school system, begin to process and um, uh, communicate with you around the press conference that happened this afternoon. And so at this time, I am going to turn things over to Dr. Roberts, and he's going to share more information about our virtual instructional model, because we will be opening virtually. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Great. Thank you, Mrs. Byers. So on your screen is an enhanced virtual model, and this model provides more live instruction, and hence why that piece of the pie is separated out from the others. One of the really key pieces of feedback we receive from our continuity of learning plan from the spring and into the summer from community feedback and feedback from our staff here um, and teachers in Baltimore County was the, the um, importance of increased live instruction for our students in a virtual environment. So. Part of that live instruction will also include more rigor and more interaction than during our continuity of learning in this past spring. Your school at this po point has shared your child's schedule, including live instruction, small group learning, independent work, and opportunities for additional supports. Also critical and key is the, is the slice of the pie on the right-hand side, social-emotional learning. This is also part of the school day through community building and strategies that support student and staff well-being, mental health, and overall wellness. So it is a comprehensive approach to educating and supporting our children as they begin their virtual learning on September 8th. Virtual instruction, and, and this will be unpacked a little bit more in more detail as we go through um, this evening. Virtual instruction will be provided on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Wednesdays will be reserved for targeted student intervention, as well as teacher professional learning and meetings. We want to reassure our families that students who are eligible for services through special education, advanced academics, English for speakers of other languages, all will receive those services through virtual learning. So this, again, this slide and this graphic really does provide our community a holistic support model and a holistic view of how we're going to engage and instruct and support our students as we begin on September 8th in our enhanced virtual learning uh, um, model. So at this point, Dr. Jones is gonna continue with a little deeper look into this model. So Dr. Jones. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Um, it's, it's very important that we all get ready for that big day, that big day which is uh, quickly approaching September 8th um, when school actually begins virtually. And to help our families prepare for virtual learning, schools will be offering outdoor pickup for devices, hotspots, and instructional materials. We know that families are eager to pick up a device and or hotspot for internet access should the need arise. Also, your child's school has a list of students who have not yet received a device, and so that will also prove to be helpful during the distribution cycle. Please note that dates and times will be determined by each school. So look out for that information from your specific school around when those materials and those devices will be provided. In addition, preschool and pre-K students will receive paper materials by mail or each of the um, three to four week units and more information will be received around that. We are in the process of finalizing meals for our students and expanded coverage uh, will be provided very shortly. Also, in thinking about our ongoing support to, um, to families, the process for enrolling students and providing documentation for both shared domicile and residency, residency verification for sixth and ninth graders is available online just go to www.bcps.org. Again, there is ongoing support for families through 
counselors and pupil personnel workers as it relates to enrollment and other school reopening, reopening issues. As we move to the next slide, it's important for us to answer the several questions that we received around, um, around technology and the use of, and the use of technology. As mentioned, school will schools will distribute devices based on their list of those who already received a device. The pickup times will be coordinated with pickup of instructional materials by your child's school and as best as possible. So that's our first area of questions that we received. Just this, these questions around access to student devices. Your, our schools will help with the distribution of that. The next area of concern was just hotspots and internet service for students. For students needing internet access, families should also inform the school to receive access to a hotspot. Our schools are in position to work with our central office staff to provide that much needed access to the internet. In terms of technology support to help families use Schoology, we do have information available on our website. Simply go to www.bcps.org and then click support for families to reach our parent university, then click Schoology support. And we have multiple languages and translated resources um, for our families. Again, several questions came in around technology. If there are any outstanding questions around technology, please reach out to the school as your um, primary uh, space of support and we will work with schools to make sure you get what you need. Ms. Byers? Thank you, Dr. Jones. Many of you also had questions that were submitted about special education. We would like to take some time to unpack some of those questions we received. Please know that if we do not address everything this evening, Baltimore County Public Schools will continue to work with the Special Education Citizen Advisory Committee, or CCAC, in ongoing discussions around students receiving special education services. The supports and services that are outlined in an individualized education program or IEP will be provided to the greatest extent possible as stated by the Maryland State Department of Education in a virtual setting. Teachers and related service providers will collaborate and communicate with our families to address each student's individual needs. I want to unpack the IEP team process a little bit. IEP teams will meet according to their annual schedule or as requested by families and schools. Interim IEP meetings can be held at any time throughout the school year to address the needs of students within the IEP document. Those meetings will continue to be held virtually at this time. Reevaluation meetings will be based on adequate data collection and the availability and use of both virtual and online evaluation tools to complete assessments for data collection. Another area of concern was with regard to one-on-one -on -one assistance. Students in need of additional adult assistance for support in academic and or behavioral learning will be identified within their IEP. The time and services will be outlined within their actual individualized education program. The supports and services that are related to the needs in a virtual educational setting will be provided virtually at this time. We will use paraeducators and adult assistants in our district and we will incorporate support staff with instructional and independent student activities for both synchronous and asynchronous times of the day. Teachers and our related service providers will work collaboratively with the use of those paraeducators to provide supports to our students and to our families. They can work collaboratively to implement allowable accommodations to instruction to best meet your students' needs. And as a team, they can work with both instructional and behavioral strategies to maintain student engagement in lessons and independent activities to maximize student learning. Finally, we received many questions around related services. Our related service providers, like speech language pathologists, occupational therapists, physical therapists, 
Our teachers and support staff will collaborate with families to provide supports to implement all available technology that will enhance student learning. The district is implementing tools and applications to support students in this process. Our related service providers may use a consultative and coaching support approach with our parents over the phone, and they can communicate through email by providing written directions to implement exercises for families to use. They also may record effective strategies related to your students' goals in lieu of hands-on practices and to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff during virtual instruction. At this time, I'd like to speak about our youngest learners. And so on this next slide, we're gonna talk about our preschool students, pre-K students, and kindergarten students. Many of you submitted questions as parents or family members of our youngest learners. I wanna start by talking about our gradual entry process. Just like we do when we open the school year brick and mortar, we will provide families with a gradual entry process for our three-year-olds, four-year-olds, pre-K students, and kindergarten students, because we know this is what is developmentally appropriate for these young learners. If you are the parent of a three-year-old or four-year-old student, please know that communication regarding specific dates for gradual entry beginning on September 8th will be provided to you from your child's teacher. We will begin the gradual entry, pro entry process with one-on-one -on -one conferences. For pre-kindergarten, those one-on-one -on -one conferences will begin on September 8th and they will be held through September 17th. You can anticipate receiving an individual conference time for a virtual conference from your child's teacher. Remote instruction for pre-kindergarten students will begin on September 21st, once all of those one-on-one -on -one conferences have been held. For our kindergarten students, one-on-one -on -one conferences will begin on September 8th, and they will be held through September 14th. Again, you will receive an individual conference time for your virtual one-on-one -on -one conference from your child's teacher and live instruction for all of our kindergarten students will begin on September 17th. I now wanna take a little bit of time to talk about what early childhood learning will look like and what you can anticipate for our youngest learners with regard to that instructional model Dr. Roberts described earlier. We know that it's very important for our youngest learners to have, both, to have periods of both whole group instruction and small group instruction. When our students are in a brick and mortar classroom, it is a wonderful thing to be able to watch our masterful early childhood teachers provide small group instruction while other students engage in independent activities that are developmentally appropriate and that can be done without adult assistance. This is how their virtual environment will look. You can anticipate small group instruction for things like phonics and English language arts and mathematics. This will be synchronous live small group instruction with your child's teacher. You can also anticipate that there will be an opportunity for the class to come together, whole group every day. Our youngest learners are social beings and we wanna give them the opportunity to come together as a whole class with a class meeting and for social emotional development. Additionally, there will be opportunities for your child to work independently. And again, this independent work will be specifically designed to be able to be completed independently without adult assistance. So we will be incorporating movement breaks into the day as well. We know it's important that our youngest learners get to move. And so when you receive your child's schedule, you will see opportunities for them to have breaks, not only from screens, but from physical learning where they can move and be throughout the day. At this time, I would like to turn things back over to Dr. Jones, who's gonna talk about instruction for our students in grades one through five. Thank you. 
Uh, to add on to what Ms. Byers said regarding our youngest learners, we want to specifically speak to grades one through five. And as outlined in the BCPS reopening plan for fall 2020, schools will have flexibility in creating a bell schedule that maximizes learning based on students' needs. S students in elementary grades will receive live instruction from teachers every day between a between a minimum of two hours and up to three and a half hours, and will then have up to three hours of independent, of independent work. Scheduling considerations that were made with students in mind was to make sure that the schedule or the best bell schedule hours for elementary school students were scheduled no earlier than 8 a.m. and no later than 4 p.m. Monday through Friday to include teacher um, opportunities for small group and individualized support for students. We wanted to stay as close as we possibly could to the bell schedules and or start and end times that our elementary students experienced prior to the pandemic. There will be time for social studies and science and English and math and special areas and all those subjects that bring our students joy at the elementary level. Social emotional learning will be provided within the daily schedule. The counselor will be involved. Um, our teachers will be equipped to provide SEL lessons. Our social workers and our classroom teachers will come together and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Included in the elementary daily schedules are opportunities for special education services for students with IEPs. Our students who receive ESOL services will still be provided services, advanced academics, intervention supports, and other areas to meet our students' individual and differentiated needs. Several questions came in around instructional materials. Questions like what school supplies, notebooks, folders, pencils, and or academic materials will be provided to our elementary students. Well, we're glad you all asked. Schools will provide essential learning materials for our elementary students. So for example, and this is not an all-inclusive list, but just to provide some examples of what our elementary school students will receive. Our elementary school students will receive reading materials and or literacy materials such as open court workbooks and reading materials associated with that program. Um, our, for math materials, our elementary school students will receive Bridges math manipulatives and workbooks. We'll have Pearson math workbooks and other reading texts that do not have digital versions available. These materials will be disseminated to schools on the instructional materials pickup day of each school. So again, please look out for that information from your child's school. Individual schedules are being created for each school and will be communicated to families. Some schools will also be providing materials such as pencils, crayons, and notebooks, and other school supplies for our elementary students. General guidance will be provided to parents and guardians from each school regarding materials that may be helpful to have at home. Schools will also provide parents and guardians with information of who to contact if additional assistance is needed with accessing instructional materials. As we move on to the social emotional learning, it is very important that all of our stakeholders and all of our community members and families and parents and guardians know that the social emotional well being of our students is very important to us at BCPS. Virtually, school counselors will continue to provide academic services and transition to middle school services for our fifth grade students and our students grades uh, one through four will have social emotional support services in the virtual environment. There are many ways to deliver these services and I'll just share a few. Some of these services will include classroom counseling lessons and in preparation for the 2020-21 school year, the counseling curriculum has been updated to reflect the need for social emotional instruction in the areas of trauma associated with recent current events, including COVID-19, and racism, there's also been an infusion of trauma-informed care and social-emotional learning that will appear in the first school counseling classroom lesson of the year for all students, K through 12, and will be embedded in lessons throughout the year. Again, it's important to note that school counselors will be working in collaboration with schools and families to make sure that the needs of our students are met. And the delivery model for counseling lessons will be delivered asynchronously via Schoology in this particular setting, but keep in mind that we will work with families to identify lessons that contain topics that may be in, 
of a sensitive nature and or may be needed for our students and there will be a parent uh, consent form around that. Individual counseling or school counselors um, can also meet with students individually as needed. Students can self-refer or they can be referred by a staff member, parent, or stakeholder. And again, that can take place during or via a, a Google Meet session. There's also small group counseling and or co consultations that can occur with our school counselors. And again, counselors will consult and collaborate with families and staff members to provide support for student achievement and to address students' mental health needs should that arise. Counselors will also uh, work with outside health providers to, in order to facilitate long-term counseling support identified for students. We will have a crisis response team that we've always had in place to support schools. And again, the crisis response services can be conducted via Google Meets, email, or phone call as determined by the counselor and or families. Our goal again is to ensure that student well-being in a virtual environment is met. And so our classroom teachers who are working very hard to prepare for our students' return will have daily class meetings with homeroom classes and or whole group meetings, as Ms. Byer said, in our schools that have departmentalization for our intermediate grades, additional class meetings may be conducted to build classroom community. That is our goal, to make sure that we build classroom community um, during our virtual start. And teachers will work again with counselors and families regarding any of the social emotional concerns that may arise in a virtual setting. Small group instruction and targeted instructional support will also be will also be provided. There will still be opportunities for advanced ac academics, intervention, targeted instructional supports, and small group instruction will be provided to, again, differentiate instruction for acceleration and enrichment. In addition to the classroom teacher, as stated before, special educators and resource staff will also provide small group in terms of the work needed for our students. At this time, we're going to turn it over to Dr. Roberts. Dr. Roberts will go take us a little further in what middle and high school schedules will look like. Dr. Roberts. Great, thank you, Dr. Jones. So we received uh, several dozen questions around the secondary schedule, specific our middle school and high school schedule. So um, for this slide, what, we, what I'd like to do is really share and answer some of those questions in three different ways. Um, one is to just provide some general parameters for how our principals, our school leaders, and school communities landed on and made decisions around their um, virtual meeting schedules or virtual meeting bell schedules during our enhanced virtual learning. But then discuss some common questions that we received um, that really had similarities and address some of those questions specifically. But then um, end with this slide around some specific questions that didn't fall necessarily into one category or another, um, just so we'll make sure that we're comprehensive in providing you responses to many of the questions that you had around middle school and high school schedule. So for a little bit of background, and you see on this graphic, middle, middle multiple schedule options for flexibility. And really what that means was our principals and our school School leaders, um, the premise from where they, from which they started was really one of flexibility. Um, in the BCPS reopening plan, f flexibility really was at the cornerstone of developing our secondary and our really our virtual meeting schedules K-12. So schools were provided with this flexibility to create their virtual meeting bell schedules to really allow for the unique circumstances prevented or presented by the COVID-19 global pandemic. We know in Baltimore County that COVID-19 has struck our county and our communities in different ways from the west side to the central to the east, north, south, and west. However you slice Baltimore County, um, it was COVID-19 impacted our communities in very different ways. So we really wanted to make sure that our schools had the flexibility to create a virtual meeting schedule that met the needs of their specific school community. So from that, specifically for our secondary schools, they really had a choice between multiple virtual meeting schedules. Those included a four period A day B day, a four period semesterized schedule, a seven period A day B day, a seven period straight schedule, or an eight period straight schedule. So I'm gonna take a few minutes just to unpack what really some of those schedules are. And as I mentioned a little earlier, um, if you have a child in secondary school, um, access was granted about two weeks ago where you could have seen 
and you can see still see if you haven't had an opportunity to log into your your Schoology account or your child to log into their Schoology account to see their virtual meeting schedule. So, for example, if you have a child whose school is meeting in a seven period A day B day rotation. You may see variants within schools that have a seven period A day, B day rotation. For example, we talked a little bit earlier and shared with you a little bit earlier around the idea of the social emotional support. It's really a comprehensive support for your child as they're engaging in enhanced virtual learning. So in a seven period A day, B rotation, your child would engage in, for example, periods one, two, three, and four on an A day. But then on the following day, a B day would engage in periods five, six, and seven, and then repeat that cycle um, on Thursday and Friday. But within a given day, as an example, on a Monday, the day may start with an advisory period. It may start with a community gathering period where in homeroom, the children have an opportunity to come together, um, to share where they are, to share in space with the teacher, um, maybe some of the stresses that they're going over. It could be a time for a check-in around academic questions or social emotional questions. It really gives that opportunity for the teacher to engage in some social emotional support, but also some college and career readiness preparation for our high school kids or for our middle school kids who are transitioning um, in eighth grade into ninth grade. And then they may, right after that 50-minute period, they may go into period one um, and then into period two. You'll see in your child's schedule there is a lunch period um, that every child has within their virtual meeting schedule to give them ample time um, for a break for lunch. Um, but then that may be um, backed up against some independent or small group work time. And then the children the, or your child may finish in periods three and four for that day. So really the day is balanced between independent work uh, small group work, depending on, on the needs of the teacher in the classroom, the teacher may choose to pull or ask a small group of students to work um, with him or her um, in a small group, then before going and transitioning into that next formal period. So in a seven period day, a day, B day rotation, they have that type of schedule, which allows that interaction between whole group synchronous instruction, which is real time live instruction that I shared in my previous um, portion of the presentation earlier on with some independent time. Some of your students in middle and high school may be engaged in what's called a four period semester, uh, excuse me, semesterized schedule. And really in short, what that means is students, instead of a child taking seven classes um, over two days for the entire year, students engage in a four period semesterized schedule would take four classes, um, a year-long class within one semester. Um, again, this goes back to the flexibility portion um, of deciding which virtual meeting schedule was best. So in that case, your child may start the day in period one, and that period one class will jump right into instruction, but then there may be a blend of independent time, either after that period or embedded in that period where there may be live instruction, and then the teacher would ask the children to go into some independent work time, um, and then come back and finish period one. Or it may be in chunks of time, where you have period one and then a chunk of time for independent time, and then going into period two. Again, lunch is, provide, or lunch is offered, there's a break for lunch with additional independent work time. Children in a four period semester I schedule would have four, the same four classes for the semester. When the second semester starts, they would then engage in their second four classes for the second semester. So in essence, they're taking uh, year long classes, a year long class within the first semester and then another set of classes within the second semester. And then certainly continuing with that, um, half credit courses um, would be taken within a quarter of time. But these are all details that certainly your school principal and your school leadership team can help you understand if you have con uh, continued questions about how those schedules work. But in essence, that is how um, the, the premise of a four period semesterized schedule. And then lastly, um, many of our schools chose a four period A day, B day. And this would be really very similar to a seven period A day, B day other than instead of seven periods over two days, students would take uh, four periods a day. They would take a four, a, four classes one day on A day, and then take four different classes on the B day. So these students would take eight classes over the course of all year. 
um, for one day and four on B day, whereas the semesterized students would take just four classes, which really leads to another point. And this really segues into some of the common community questions that we had around some of the advantages. So many questions were received about what was the thinking? Can you please explain some of the thinking of why my school might have chosen a semesterized schedule versus an A day, B day schedule? Well, in that, Schools certainly focused on the flexibility piece, but they also know that in COVID-19 and what all of us are dealing with, the pressures on adults certainly are amplified on our students and the pressures that they're feeling, whether in middle school or whether in high school, we know those pressures can be great. So again, knowing the impact has varied across our community in Baltimore County, Schools, um, one of the reasons schools may have selected a semesterized schedule was really to allow students to focus really on four classes at a time instead of eight classes at a time. So this was really one of the primary drivers um, for some of our schools to select that semesterized schedule would be to take a little bit off the student's plate to help them focus a little bit more on those four classes and then pick up those remaining four classes as they go into um, the second semester. But again, other schools that chose other options have their justifications and their rationale for selecting their schedules based on the needs and the flexibility um, within their school communities. So in terms of um, maintaining the chosen schedule, we did have questions related, will my school keep that schedule as we return to school? Um, as Mrs. Byers mentioned with the governor's press conference, um, when students, if and when students begin returning to school, um, as is built into our reopening plan that was submitted to the state earlier this month, schools will maintain, our secondary schools will maintain the chosen schedules for the remainder of this school year. Um, so the schedule that they're running in the enhanced virtual model will continue through June of 2021. Um, so that was, again, wanted to address that question. That was a common question that came forward. Another one was around advanced placement for schools, um, particularly for parents or for schools, communities that had not ever operated in a four period semesterized schedule. There was concern and question around, well, what about advanced placement students who finish their courses at the end of January or in one semester, but don't take the test until May? Well, certainly we've learned and we know that in Baltimore County, we have had several schools um, previous to about five or six years ago that did run um, a semesterized schedule. And what we've learned from that and will implement going into this year for those schools who are operating on a four by four semesterized schedule, Teachers know that they will, when they begin reviewing for those AP courses, typically around April, um, as we get into the third quarter, advanced placement teachers know that come April, early to mid-April, they begin review sessions concurrently with finishing the coursework. So teachers and administrators and school-based leaders will wrap their arms around children who finished their AP classes back in late January and make sure that they're included in those review options. And however those review options are presented, to students. Um, the students who did finish in January will be in, in, are expected to be included in those review sessions in April to really give ample time for those students who did finish in January, give them time to catch up, really refresh, as you see there in that third bullet, a spring refresher. Um, so all students are prepared and properly prepared and effectively prepared for their AP exams in early May. Um, the last bullet around middle schools and high schools, their time, and you might have heard um, Dr. Jones a little bit earlier talking about elementary schools have an eight to four uh, window of time um, for specific reasons. Secondary schools have a window of time from eight to three. So again, in line with trying to make our enhanced virtual schedule as much aligned to a regular school day as we can, um, students will have their school day from eight to three, and that time would be consistent during our enhanced virtual schedule, and that is for all of our middle schools and high schools as we're in an enhanced virtual model. So I'd like to wrap up this slide with really addressing some specific questions that didn't fit neatly into one particular bucket, but we want to honor the questions that were sent in and received by our community. Um, there were questions around um, why didn't schools within a particular feeder pattern um, select the same schedules? Well, we know that the needs of our elementary schools and middle schools and high school students vary 
greatly, even within a feeder pattern. So again, the flexibility was provided at the specific level of elementary and secondary, middle school and high school, because we know the needs and the, and the demands on the rigor of the coursework, um, credit bearing courses versus non-credit bearing courses, and the overall instructional program, the needs are different and the expectations are different from a kindergartner through a 12th grader. So hence why we couldn't schedule an entire feeder pattern to have the same type of virtual meeting bell schedule. Um, there was also question around coordination of lunch times, um, and certainly a valid question, but again, that goes back to the previous response. Because of the uniqueness and the flexibility of the schedules, elementary, middle, and high, it wasn't feasible at this time to, to coordinate the exact same lunch times within a feeder pattern or within all elementary, all middle, and all high, again, because of the instructional needs and the expectations for our students in our schools. Um, and then lastly, um, I talked a little bit about the, the needs already around the semesterized schedule. So just really wanted to reiterate that point again, because we did receive several questions around why. Um, so I'll end with that idea of really supporting our students' social emotional learning and the stress that we know they are working through right now in this environment. Um, that was really a, a cornerstone to why some of our schools chose that four by four semesterized schedule. So with that, um, I, it is 641. So at this time, um, we're going to have time for a few live questions. Um, so Mr. Burke, we're going to hand it back over to Mr. Burke, who's been monitoring the chat room. And over these next 10 to 15 minutes, as we wrap up this community conversation, Mr. Burke will be sharing some of the questions or, or lumping some of the questions together for Mrs. Byers, Dr. Jones, and I. So, Mr. Burke. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Uh, I am going to summarize some of the questions. Um, I'm going to throw the first set of questions to Ms. Byers. Uh, Mrs. Byers, some of them are going to be quite simple to answer. We had a number of parents join us late, and I just want to clarify. Will Baltimore County Public Schools be opening virtually? So thank you, Mr. Burke. I'm happy to answer that yes. Um, I did make a statement earlier in our presentation this evening um, regarding the fact that uh, we watched the press conference live with everyone else this afternoon. And so um, this presentation did focus on virtual learning. At this time, parents should know that we will be opening virtually on September 8th. Thank you. Mrs. Byers, there were also a number of questions that asked why BCPS didn't submit a reopening plan to the state by August 14th. Could you comment on that, please? Our reopening plan was submitted to the state by August 14th. Thank you very much. Uh, we have quite a few families on the line, Mrs. Byers, that speak Spanish, and we're wondering, is there a way to get this information in Spanish? Great question. Um, many of our resources around reopening uh, have been translated on our website. So if you go to www.bcps.org under our reopening section of the website, we do have um, announcements that have been translated into multiple languages and information that has been translated. Additionally, um, this afternoon, Dr. Jones and I had a really great opportunity to participate um, in a Facebook Live question and answer session um, that was done and translated into Spanish. And so if needed, I know our communications office would be happy to share the link to that broadcast because uh, the entire broadcast was translated and it included much of the information we're sharing this evening in Spanish. Thank you, Mrs. Byers. I would also add that tonight's presentation was closed captioned uh, in Spanish if needed. So um, par parents might be able to go back and look at that if they uh, wish to. One final question, Mrs. Byers, because you spoke about IEPs, could you also talk about what parents should do if their child has a 504 or what they should expect? Absolutely, thank you, Mr. Burke. So very similar to our students with special needs, students of parents with 504 plans should anticipate that virtual meetings can be held in the event that we are in the virtual, the enhanced virtual uh, school environment. Those accommodations that are identified on a student's 504 plan, um, again, will be implemented 
in the virtual setting. Um, different types of assistive technology may be used in order to provide those accommodations. And similar to our students with um, IEPs who have accommodations, we will be utilizing our paraeducators to be able to support and provide those accommodations in the virtual setting to the great ex extent possible as explained by MSDA. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Byers. Dr. Jones, I have a few questions for you as well, please. Um, the first question is, do I need to buy supplies for my high school students? I know you spent some time talking about supplies, but I would like you to uh, just take a little more time to clarify around high school students. Thank you, Mr. Burke. That's a, a very good question. And several parents are asking questions about supplies for high school students. What we have asked that families do um, as an initial kind of step is to see and contact the school around what will be offered per each course. Because what we are attempting to do um, at each school is to provide students with safe materials to use at home that provide the instructional support that is needed for each course. However, if once materials are distributed at the, distributed at the school and students still have material needs, then it would be very important for the family to connect with the, um, the teacher and then work with the school to make sure that the student has exactly what they need. So I would say to parents and families, hold off on making any purchases until families actually see what will be distributed by each school per course to make sure that um, the schools have an opportunity to provide the plethora of materials that are being gathered and organized and packaged for our students during reopening. Thank you, Dr. Jones. An additional question. Early in the presentation, we stated that um, parents and students should have received their schedules by now. If they haven't received their schedules, what should they do? Another excellent question. If a student has not received their schedule as of now, there are a couple of things that they could do, but what I would recommend is reaching out to the school directly. Um, reaching out to the school to make a request for the student's schedule, because as we stated, by now students ha should have received um, their schedules and they should have been available um, to them depending on what, um, what grade range they're in. Um, our, our secondary students should have received their schedules and they should have been made available to them online. Also, um, our uh, youngest learners and or our elementary school students should have received something directly from the school. And so I would say contact the school right away to make sure that the schedule um, is in place for the student because we want to make sure that we're up and running and students have exactly what they need for that first day. Thank you, Dr. Jones. One final question. Sure. Wednesday, September 9th, is the second day of school. That week is also only a four-day school week. Will that day be a synchronous or in-person day for students or an asynchronous or independent work day for students? So with, with the first week of school being somewhat of a, an abbreviated week, one of the conversations that we've had based on input from families and the community was that any time that there would be an abbreviated or short week, that would students would not miss out. Students will still receive, I would say, um, synchronous and in some cases on top of that, asynchronous instruction. Um, there will not be any in-person instruction during that time, but students and families can count on synchronous and asynchronous learning during any week where there is an abbreviated an abbreviated week because we want to make sure that our students do not miss out on instructional opportunities. And more information about what um, Wednesdays and or abbreviated weeks will look like will be forthcoming as we continue to roll out our virtual plan. Thank you, Dr. Jones. I appreciate your answers. Thank I am you. going to now, you're welcome. I am now going to switch to Dr. Roberts. Dr. Roberts, could you address athletics and talk a little bit about how the decision was made to um, postpone the, the season and move it further into the year? 
Yeah, no, absolutely, Mr. Burke. And, and before I jump into that question, just wanted to um, add to um, one of Mrs. Byer's responses that um, for our community, I, we're also closed captioning this as in Spanish, but as well as in Urdu, Arabic, French, German, and Chinese. So certainly want to make sure we reach out to as many of our community members as possible. So, Mr. Burke, thanks for the question. And athletics certainly is is another area of of question um, from our community and, and we have a, such a phenomenal athletic program in Baltimore County from our middle school um, program through our high school program, our varsity programs in high school. So uh, the decisions ultimately to get us to the point where we have virtual training um, while we're in an enhanced virtual environment and then moving towards um, in person. That was really done, started with consultation with uh, MPSSAA, which is the state governing body for all Maryland County um, athletic programs. Every county then has a athletic director, a county athletic director. So when you look at the at the kind of the top of the pyramid with MPSSA, which is part of the Maryland State Department of Education, really guidance was taken from them, and their guidance was certainly taken from CDC and all the local and, and the state and national health professionals in recommending ultimately the guidelines that Baltimore County adopted, um, which is that as we enter an enhanced virtual environment, um, our students students, all students um, will have an opportunity for virtual training um, within their schools. So if a child was interested or if a student was interested in trying out for a sport, um, they will at this point in the enhanced virtual environment will be able to train. Um, so as a student, uh, particularly a high school student, you can expect some type of communication from your school, whether directly from the athletic director at the school level or from other school leadership to provide some more details around how that will work in a virtual environment. Then as students begin to return over the course of the year into schools, at that point, um, then our eligibility requirements um, will kick back in because at this point in a virtual environment, we're opening the virtual training to all students. Um, in Baltimore County, we do have a 2.0 eligibility requirement to participate in athletics. So in a virtual environment though, we really wanna make sure, I go back to that second slide, where we talked about really supporting all children, supporting their emotional well-being, their academic and intellectual well-being, but also their physical well-being. Um, and knowing that athletics plays a big part in that. So we really wanted to make sure that any child who was interested in really just working out or keeping in shape, um, to help keep their, their mind and body and spirit um, as one, give them an opportunity for some virtual training um, with whatever particular sport they may have been interested in or a particular area that they've been interested in. Again, but as we transition into students returning and ultimately transitioning to a full athletic program, then those eligibility requirements would be reinstated. And then we go into what is kind of rather expected in terms of tryouts and meeting eligibility requirements and then having tryouts for particular sports. So as it is now and in, in shared in our reopening plan, our winter sports would begin um, in the winter and then would have a brief, an abbreviated season. And then uh, we would transition to spring sports and then end the year with our regular fall athletic program. So at this point, Ms. Burke, that's what um, is in our reopening plan um, and certainly something we want to make sure our students and parents are aware of again to we can't reiterate strongly enough the idea of, of keeping our students uh, physically fit as well as academically and social emotionally thank you dr roberts three more quick questions please dr roberts um i'm a if I'm a high school student on an A-B schedule or a middle school student on an A-B schedule, how will I know if Tuesday, September the 8th is an A or B day? So that is a good question. Schools will typically start on an A day um, for, for continuity um, and just really A day, B day. We want schools to start on that A day um, and then certainly more information in terms of that rotation. And we talked a little bit earlier around the the weeks that have shortened weeks, those types of fluctuations and, and pivots will be made by the schools and schools will be communicating that out to students. But certainly our students in an A day, B day schedule can expect that their September 8th on Tuesday would be an A day for, um, for them. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. 
Um, in the spring, if I didn't request a laptop because I didn't need one, but I need one now, what should I do? Yeah, so uh, another great question. So if you did not receive a laptop in the spring, so our schools have already been working on that. You will receive a laptop. Um, what you want to do is call your school. Um, if they're not already aware, based on various databases that we have, that you did not receive one in the spring um, or do not have one, then and you want to notify your school and they will submit um, what we call um, a ticket for you um, and then that will trigger a whole series of events that ultimately will have a laptop um, sent to the school um, that you can receive during the school scheduled um, material pickup. Thank you again, Mr. Roberts, uh, Dr. Roberts, I'm sorry. Uh, one final question, and this question Mr. Corns may need to jump in on as okay. well, but if, if you've got this one, Dr. Roberts, um, <laughs> we'll, we'll start there. Um, <laughs> how can I get assistance updating my computer? We went to the school to update it, and we couldn't get it to work. We've heard that there are some schools where you can get physical support. Um, so do you have any advice on what I should do if I can't get my computer to update? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I will start this, Mr. Corns, and please feel free to follow up um, if I leave something out or, or misspeak. So um, that was really a recent topic of a conversation um, a little bit earlier today. So there are very specific, a very specific set of instructions um, to kind of re to update um, your devices if you are already in possession, kind of juxtaposed to the, to the previous question you had, Mr. Burke, if you already have a BCPS device that you had during our continuity of learning or was issued to you during our continuity of learning, then what schools are doing now, some have already done and, and some will continue to do, is to share those steps either through social media. So what I would recommend is check your, school, your school's Twitter account, Facebook account. Uh, many schools have posted those steps to their social media and or many schools have enlarged those directions and taped them to their front windows, um, to their to their doors. So as you go to the school, um, you can just maintain social distance and with your mask on and obviously go to the school. I mean, you can read those directions because the internet signal, the Wi-Fi signal does extend out about 50 feet outside of all of our schools. And you can see those directions and you can just sit right there and update your computer. Mr. Corns, I don't know if I, if I covered all the details or things you want, anything you wanted to add to that. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. I will say that uh, the update to devices applies to students who are carrying a Windows device. Uh, any student who's been issued a Chromebook, uh, normally those are our elementary school students, but there is a small uh, percentage of our students in uh, middle and high that may have one. Uh, they are not in need of going to the school to do that update, but only our PC carrying students. Um, a, we've had uh, one small uh, misunderstanding uh, in the community around the fact that they need to run Windows updates, uh, which is a whole separate process. This is a um, internal update that BCPS is doing some updates to the way that our devices are managed. So there is not a need for us to uh, have students sit and try and do Windows updates, which is causing a little bit of uh, misunderstanding uh, when our staff go, or our students go to do their, their update. The, those in, instructions that were sent out about um, joining the Wi-Fi, doing a log out, log out, and re, a log in, log out, and restart uh, will do all of the things that students need without having to run official Windows updates. That's not the intent of this update process. Thank you, Mr. Corns and Dr. Roberts. Dr. Roberts, could I ask you now, please, to just make some closing remarks? Dr. Roberts, you're muted. I am. Thank you, Mr. Burke. You're so, welcome. ladies and gentlemen, um, and, and community members of Team BCPS, first, on behalf of Dr. Williams um, and all of the staff um, in Baltimore County Public Schools, we, we truly and, and heartfully thank you um, for joining us this evening. Um, these are certainly rapidly changing times and stressful times um, that all of us, as a community um, and individually and as families, we're working through, but we have done this together. So, we want to thank you for taking this past hour to spend 
spend time with us. This is just the beginning, though, of our reopening conversations. Um, we'll certainly continue to communicate through our advisory groups and the many established stakeholder groups that we have um, in Baltimore County Public Schools. So we encourage you to continue to share your questions. Um, if not in this form, then certainly within our established advisory groups, our Board of Education advisory groups, our, your local PTAs, your school-based PTAs, um, or just sharing them with your school leadership. Um, and rest assured that those questions will um, filter through to leadership here in Baltimore County, and we will work diligently to address those questions and continue to address those questions. Um, and again, as Mrs. Byers mentioned a little bit earlier, on the Somos Baltimore Latino Facebook page, um, you'll see that pre-recorded message that Dr. Jones and Mrs. Byers um, uh, provided, and it is in Spanish for our bilingual English-Spanish communities. So again, that's the Somos Baltimore Latino Facebook page where you can find more information, and it is accessible on our BCPS webpage. So lastly, please be sure to check our reopen page for continual updates on the bcps.org, as well as staying in touch with your child's school um, or any other established stakeholder groups. So again, thank you for joining us this evening, and we wish you and your child a wonderful 2021 school year. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.